Well, hello everybody. Welcome back. Welcome to the Q&A for Judy versus Capitalism. I hope you enjoyed the film. So for those of you that weren't able to join the pre-screen event, my name is Kelly Strawn. I'm the Executive Artistic Director at Workman Arts, the presenters of Rendezvous with Madness. So before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Indigenous land on which I am presently located and you can think about the land that you are on. So I am in Toronto, which comes from the Kenyan Keha word Takaronto, which can be translated as where the trees meet the water. It is part of the traditional territories of many nations, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. So welcome. Uh, Nora Loretto, she is our moderator tonight. Nora is a writer and activist. She writes regularly for the National Observer, the Washington Post, and many other publications. She's the editor of the Canadian Association of Labour Media and with Sandy Hudson. She hosts a popular podcast called Sandy and Nora. She also has a book coming out in 10 days. It's called Take Back the Fight, Organizing Feminism for the Digital Age. So welcome, Nora. And she will be having a conversation with the star of our film, <laughs> Judy Rebick. Yeah, I so, never thought I'd heard you know, You are the star. <laughs> you are the star, Judy. Um, so just a few housekeeping notes. If you would like to ask a question, please type the question into that question box on the right-hand side of your screen. So Nora will begin the conversation. Um, she and Judy will go back and forth and chat for a while, and then we will take the questions that show up in the chat. So Nora will do her best to get to all of the questions that we have. Um, and depending on uh, you know, how many questions we have, this can go 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Um, and I'm sure there will be lots to talk about. So just a note that Workman Arts values inclusivity, anti-oppression, safety at all levels. So everyone has a role to play in maintaining that spirit to ensure that we are all treating each, other's with respect, treating each other with respect. We also have an active listener, so Kat Singer. Um, I'm just looking to see if I can actually see you on the Zoom. There they are, Kat Singer. Uh, so if you need to step off of the Zoom, if you need some extra support, we know that some of these conversations can uh, be challenging and it's important to explore challenging material together. But if you do require support, please do get in touch with them directly. So the number is on our website. You go to the Judy versus Capitalism program page and you will see Kat's contact information. All right, so it gives me great pleasure to hand things over to Nora Loretto and Judy Rebick. Welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Kelly. Judy, it's so good to see I, you. Uh, great to see you too. <laughs> it's, been, it does, it's been a long time, but it doesn't feel like it because I always see you on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> yeah. I'm, it's, such a, it's such a pleasure to have this conversation with you because, you know, we... Uh, you froze. Nora uh, froze. Organizing. Yeah. Um, yeah, really. I actually froze now. I, of all the times for me to freeze, I freeze right <laughs> as we start. Okay. <laughs> um, at, we, 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 our time overlapped at, uh, at Ryerson University, but of course we're, we're very different generations. And the thing that I love about this film is it reaches back into a story that, um, that you've told many, many times that I've just finished telling as well, but that I think that a lot of people don't know. Uh, and it tells it in a way that is creative and engaging. So tell us a little bit about um, how you feel to see this story told in, in such an innovative way. Ah, okay. Well, I love the film. I think that it's a beautiful film. And I think it, one thing that I love about it is it captures the spirit of the pro-choice struggle, like half the films on the pro-choice struggle. And it captures a spirit of, of the intensity of it, the conflict of it, even the violence of it, uh, in a way I've never seen a film do. So I love that part of it. And then the other part that I, that I think is amazing is the way Mike 
in his images uh, chose to show the multiple personalities or dissociative identity disorders through these faces that he's got um, on the subway and sort of showing it as almost like we're all, we all have these different parts of ourselves and, and then, and all these different parts of ourselves are like all the different parts of ourselves as a community. I don't even, it's even hard to say because it's so poetic, but I really love that. And I, you know, I, I called the book Heroes, my book Heroes in My Head because I was able to see the dissociative identity disorder as a positive thing, a defense mechanism, what Mike calls an act of creation, he calls it a creative act mm. of a child. Um, but Mike's film helped me to see it in a more positive way even than that. So uh, those are the things I love about the film. I really, I really, uh, I really do like it. Yeah. It's pretty amazing to think of how it is necessary for, for anybody engaged in struggle, anyone who's engaged in multi-year struggle and activism, mm -hmm. how you do have to bring many personalities, many approaches, many strategies to the work that we do. So tell, tell us a little bit about that, how you uh, approach things differently over the years and, and how those personalities came out in different, uh, in different moments in your life? Well, I think in terms of that, the, there's, I think there's two things about it. One is that um, I became a public figure at the same time as I realized how deeply wounded I was. So I had, I fell into a clinical depression in 1980. And one of the first things I did after I came out of that depression was I went to a meeting of the, the founding meeting of the Ontario Coalition for Abortion Clinics. <laughs> um, and the discussion was, should we get Dr. Morgenthaler to open a clinic in Toronto, right? And um, I don't know, I guess I had a second, a sixth sense that this would engage me and would be good for me. I didn't yet know why I was depressed or anything like that, but I knew I had to have something that was engaging. And in those, ten, in those eight or nine years of the pro-choice struggle, I just, you know, I was working full time. I was, and I'm, I know you know how to do this too. I was working full time and I was an activist full time. And I was in therapy to deal with the depression and, the, and, and coming out of the depression. Uh, but other than the therapy sessions, I just didn't think about it. I put it aside. And, um, and, and then uh, in, uh, I guess it was about 1989, um, I started, a, a, something happened in the pro-choice struggle that triggered my memories of abuse. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly, my mind was flooded with memories of abuse and I couldn't think about anything else. And I knew a therapist that I'd met in the pro-choice struggle. So I started to see her and then the story started to come out and uh, the story of the abuse and then realizing it was my father that had abused me. And then within a few sessions, I started to speak in these different voices. Wow. Um, yeah. And then what happened was I got asked to run for president of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women. And this is just about two months after, you no, know, a month after this. And uh, everybody was against it. My therapist was against it. My brother, who was the person I was closest to, was against it. And, uh, and the, what was called, the, what my therapist called the guardian personality, that is the personality that took care of all the other ones, right. was also against it. But I knew... <laughs> <laughs> that it was would be good for me because healing from abuse childhood especially well any kind of abuse but ch especially childhood abuse you, the feeling in therapy is a feeling of total powerlessness mm -hmm. right because you were powerless but uh and i thought well if i'm president of the biggest women's group in the country i'll feel powerful in my life so i can handle being powerless in therapy and it worked right it was, i think in retrospect it was a little irresponsible because I was really um, barely holding it together, mm -hmm. but I did hold it together. And one of the advantages I have is I have a performance thing, sort of when I have to perform, I can no matter what. So mm -hmm. um, that helped me too. <laughs> I, I, I understand that. <laughs> I, I understand that. Um, I, I want to ask about uh, creating the, the, the film, but, but first, um, 
you mentioned the founding meeting, meeting of the Ontario Coalition of Abortion Clinics, and I certainly remember reading about that in Ten Thousand Roses, the, the book that you that you wrote um, that brings together a lot of the of key voices from the women's movement from the nineteen sixties right until the the nineteen nineties. And the um, you said it like it was an intense time, right? And I, I I can think of in the book I think it was Carolyn Egan was talking about this, and then there's also the women talking about organizing Winnipeg, on on how. Um, there was a lineup down like the block bef like before the meeting to get in. And this was a moment where like some of the activists were like, we're never going to experience this moment again because there's so much intensity around it. Yeah, yeah. Talk about that, that, that moment and what well, that intensity looked yeah. like. That was the first public meeting we had, um, okay. we had for, for Toronto people. It was at OISE where a lot of political meetings used to happen and the auditorium there. And Dr. Morgenthaler came from Montreal, and that was the first time I met him. And, um, and uh, yeah, it was amazing. People were lined up around the block. People just really felt that the moment had come for this fight. You know, they had won the fight in Montreal, for people who don't know. They had won the fight in Quebec. Dr. Morgenthaler had gone to jail. He was acquitted by three juries, but at that time, a judge could overturn jury decision, which he also changed that law. And, um, and, so the fact that we decided to do it in Ontario the same way, which was to open an illegal clinic and challenge the law, it really inspired people's imagination. And Dr. Morgenthaler, yeah, he, he, he was speaking. So it, it was very, and, and of course the anti-choice uh, disrupted the meeting. They, they got in somehow and we didn't recognize them then, later we recognized them. And I was, and I was chairing it so when they started to uh, yell, when Dr. Morgenthaler started to speak, I started to lead a chant. What do we want choice? When do we want it now? It became a famous chant of a thing. And we just out chanted them rather than. Right. Yeah. And then we removed, we had them, you know, people, they left because they couldn't do, they couldn't disrupt the meeting. So, and that was the day that Dr. Morgenthaler asked me to be the spokesperson for the clinic, even though he had just met me. Wow. <laughs> Um, the the film is is uh, is obviously deeply personal, and I imagine uh, that uh, it could have been just anybody that that made a film uh, as personal uh, as was made. Uh, talk a little bit about that relationship that you have with Mike, how this project came to be, and how this vision went from conversations I imagine that you had uh, to to what uh, what we saw tonight. Well, I met Mike through another a friend of a mutual friend, Velcro Ripper, is also a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker. And uh, at the time he was living on the island and both, he invited both Mike and I for dinner. I think it was New Year's Eve. And we just, we hit it off and, um, and we became friends. And it was, it's kind of an, like, uh, you know, we're not a couple, but we're an odd couple. Like, cause Mike's like this very brilliant artist. You know, he's written 35 books about filmmakers, right? Wow. And he's, you know, and he's, made, I don't know how many films, like uh, uh, countless hundreds and maybe even a thousand films, I don't know. And he's, you know, but it's, they're artistic films, they're, um, but they're always, they always have content, his films. They're not abstract, like, you know, Andy Warhol, but I was thinking Andy Warhol, you know, watch paint dry was my idea of experimental <laughs> films, was right. watch paint dry, right? Um, so I didn't, you know, I liked him and everything, but I didn't think, you know, we'd hit it off the, the way we did, but we did. And we became very close friends over time. And then one day he just said, Judy, I think I'd like to make a film about you. And uh, so I asked Velcro, what do you think? And Velcro said, Mike, making a f asking to make a film about you is like a great painter asking to paint your portrait. <laughs> I said Velcro said, and I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do it. And I didn't have any doubt that we could work out any problems because we were, like I say, by this point, we'd been friends for years. So, and uh, the way we did it was he just came over like usual. And I sat at my dining room table and he asked me questions and I talked. And because it was just him and I, I didn't really think about the fact that so many other people would be watching it. <laughs> That's true. That really is true. Right. Um, and, um, and then he, you know, his process is very interesting because it's not linear. Like he's like, you know, in that way, like I think of him as a poet of images. And um, over time it changed, what he did changed. And the, his first cut was, I couldn't 
I, the first cut I watched and I went, okay, like I like the pro-choice part, but the rest of it, I don't know. But other people said that too. And he, and he took the criticism and he reorganized it and came up with this chapter thing, which really works. And uh, yeah, so that's how it happened. Um, and then he also did some, he, at first he wasn't sure I was gonna be in it at all, except for my voice. Right. But over time he decided that he had at least some shots of me, I guess. <laughs> Did you um did you have any uh, role in choosing the visuals or did you have any guidance or no way? Eh? No, 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 not at all, not at all. What was it like to see someone else interpreting you versus capitalism? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was very surprised at the title, I have to say. Okay. Although I will show, show you my t-shirt here that I wore, especially for the occasion. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, but I love the title. So the title, uh, it was just his idea. I don't know why exactly. He's doing a series on capitalism now, anti-capitalism. So he's working on a film. Uh, I, I don't know how I'm supposed to say that. But anyway, it's part of the first of a series. Okay. And um, yeah, no, I would never even think to do that, you know, because what do I know? <laughs> 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 but I, I did have a moment where I introduced him one night, I introduced him to a friend of mine and uh, she said, oh yes, I know your work. And I said, and I said, Mike's making a film about me. And, she, and he said, well, it's not exactly about Judith, he said <laughs> before I'd seen anything. <laughs> and he had a, there was a friend of his there who was like him, an experimental filmmaker, but also makes documentary. So I said to his friend, what did he mean by that? Like, does he mean I'm not going to be in the film at all? Or he says, well, that could be, you know, you could be in the film for three minutes or eight hours. Right. <laughs> so I think he has, you know, it's the artistic process. It's not exactly thought out in advance. Right, right. <laughs> Um, for, for everybody watching, of course, uh, please ask questions if you have any. Um, Kelly, remind us how people can ask questions. So you'll see um, when you're watching on the screen, there is a little um, place up at the top right where you can put in a question. And then uh, our super smart tech people, uh, Alexi and Scott, will make sure that it gets um, to us and we will ask the question. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I, I find it's like when I saw the title of the film, it was so funny because the first thing that I thought of was like that the, the, the fierce girl statue standing in front of the bull on, on uh, Wall Street, right? And I, I, I don't know, I, I didn't know you as a little girl, but of course, having read uh, Heroes in My Head, I, I, I now have this like, you know, total life kind of history, I guess, of Mm -hmm. of, of your, um, of your coming to age and activism and, uh, and really always being around activism. What's it like looking back and forward, uh, but back as we're looking at a film that's been filmed, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, on a life, uh, of activism like that you've had? Well, I think I've, yeah. What's it like? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I I feel good, you know, I feel good about it. I also feel good about the person I've become. Um, I was a much angrier person then. Like, in fact, anger was the only real feeling that I could feel, it was anger. Hmm. And I was angry a lot. And uh, I think it made me less tolerant than I am now, um, less open, uh, certainly. Um, and yeah, so I feel like, and also through the, I learned a lot through my activism. Like when I was president of NAC, we don't go into this much in the film, but when I was president of NAC, I knew there had been like 10 years in the 80s of women of color um, and indigenous, well, indigenous women were always on the NAC executive, but women, and there were three indigenous women on the NAC executive when I was president. And um, I knew that my, my main job as president was to have the, the biggest women's organization reflect the women's movement, which meant much more diverse and including women with disabilities, black women, uh, you know, what we call BIPOC now. Um, so I had to really change. So that was one way I had to change because um, in the book, I tell a story, you don't tell this in the film, where um, at the first meeting that I chaired, the NAC executive, uh, one, a woman from Ontario ran out crying and I, I kind of didn't have much time for her. And I just ignored it, right? And I noticed that the indigenous women were uncomfortable. And so I said, what's wrong? And 
the older, older, the oldest of them, Priscilla Satie said, well, it's not how we deal with feelings. You know, we, we think feelings have to be part of the meeting. And, um, but, you know, so I said, well, how would you deal with it? Well, we would ask her what's going on, right? And I'm going like, oh, oh no, like, if a white woman had said that, I'd say, oh, give me a break, you know, but I said, okay, I, we have to change. And so I said, well, why don't you chair the meeting? I turned the chair over to her and show us how to do that. Mm. And uh, she agreed to do it for one day, for one day, and that was it. And uh, so I had to learn to listen, which I never really was very good at. I was always good at talking, but I wasn't very good at listening. So, right. so I, you know, I see that. I don't see that in the film so much, but certainly in the book, I see that. Yeah. So, but, but what do you mean? Like, I didn't, I, maybe I didn't get your question the way you meant it. Like, oh no, that's exactly that's exactly okay. it. Because it's interesting because because you've been at the center of so many of these movements that 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 evolution that you describe really also is reflective of a broader evolution within social movements in general yes. in Canada. And, you know, like the film talking about, you know, Judy versus capitalism and what is capitalism, right? Like, are we, are we talking about and patriarchy and misogyny and, mm -hmm. and, and ableism and all of the oppressions that come along with capitalism? But it's, it's such a, it's such a different way to look, I think, at our struggles today than we looked at them in the 90s and the 80s and certainly 70s, 60s, 50s and, and, and before. So like, ha you, you feel a change in yourself, but how do you see that change manifesting itself in, in the way movements operate now? Well, the, there's lots of changes, right? Obviously, the internet's made huge changes because now we have networks, we can build global movements much easier. We had global movements back then. The anti-war movement was a global movement, the feminist movement in a different way, but uh, not like now, right? Um, the, other, you know, the other thing is I think we believe that we could change the laws and that would change society. I think even the radicals amongst us believe that to a degree. I mean, I was a revolutionary. I thought we had to have revolution to overthrow capitalism. But in the movement, we were fighting to change the laws. Mm. And that's true of the civil rights movement. It was true of the women's movement. It was true of all the movement, you know, bringing in the charter, the Bill of Rights, uh, get, you know, having better laws on violence. And I think the movements now understand just changing laws aren't enough and that it's the culture that has to change and there has to be transformative change. And while there was an element of the movement back then, it was a, it was a, a minority. Now the pro-choice movement is a little different because OCAC was mostly socialist feminists. Uh, we were on the left of the women's movement, if you want. But, um, but generally, uh, I'd say there, that the movements now are more radical in their understanding of how to change things and much more focused on changing culture, not just laws. So um, I think that's a difference. And of course, they're way more diverse. Uh, when I started being an activist, there were very few people of color around, right? There were lots of indigenous people, but not, not people of color. There was much less immigration in the 60s, right? The big waves of immigration from the global south came in the 80s. Um, but um, yeah, so the movements are more diverse. They're female-led, which wasn't true back then either. The problem of, of sexism was way worse. It still exists. I'm not saying it doesn't. Way worse. Um, you know, so there's lots of changes. Um, I all, but I do also see sometimes less tolerance for difference. We made alliances across big differences. You know, in the early days of the women's movement, you had radical feminists, liberal, liberal feminists basically just wanted more rights. And socialist feminists, radical, radical feminists tended to be anti-male then. And, um, and we really disagreed with each other. Like I, I remember chairing a meeting in OCAC where the radical feminists didn't want Morgenthaler because he was a man to be mm -hmm. on the clinic. We couldn't find a woman doctor to do it. And I was like, I had no time for that. You know? I had no time for that point of view. So, you know, we, but we worked across those differences. And I think up until recently, I think the Black Lives Matter up, upsurge is a little, a little more diverse of opinion than, uh, but, but the, in the last 10 years or so, I think there's been uh, an unwillingness to, you sort of, I say the difference is in my generation, we said, I'm right and you're wrong. And the next generation said, I'm right and you're a bad person, mm. right? And so I think the writing people off 
because you disagree with them on something, even if it's substantial, uh, is worse now than it was then. Yeah, I, I, I write a lot about that in my book and mm -hmm. how um, partly that's, I think, probably fueled by the fact that so much of our debate happens online and you actually are not forced to confront or be confronted by um, in debate, in good faith debate, I mean, you know, not, not anything yeah. that's hostile or, or abusive. And one of the, the, the things that really struck me in the discussion of, of forming NAC uh, was, uh, did you want a NAC that um, was uh, led by, by, a, by a partisan who had connections, direct connections with government, or did you want to elect a president who was independent, even if they had a political outlook that was not great. And so I'm, I'm yeah. talking, of course, of, of the choice between Laura Sadia and I don't remember who the liberal was, but that you had Madeleine yeah. Perrin, yeah. like a radical Quebec trade unionist convincing these radical feminists to just, just vote for the conservative because at the end of the day, she still wants an independent women's organization whereas the liberal actually wants us to come very close to government. And I think we see that very clearly today, the danger of what happens when the women's movement gets too close to government, because I mean, we have a feminist prime minister and so we're post-feminist, aren't we? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and the, and the feminist movement, maybe we better move over to the, I was just thinking maybe we should move to the mental health Things. Well, I had one more question about oh, the film okay. too, but, but yeah, actually, and it, it, like, I know it, like, you obviously have parts of the film that are, that are, that are, um, that you find, like, that you like more, or that you, that are, that are your favorite, maybe I should say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so tell us about the, the parts of the film that you, that you really are, treasure the most. Well, I think that, I think the part, as I said, about the multiple person, one of the, one of the things that at a certain point in the film, he, there's images of these two women who are sort of play fighting and then one of them picks up the other one. And an interviewer said to me, you know, he thought that one woman picking up the other woman and walking around with her was a beautiful image of dissociation. Mm -hmm. That what we do when we are dissociating is we help ourselves, right? And that image for him was that, which I thought was very cool. I didn't, I didn't see that, but he did. And this is, what I say about it being a portrait is that different people see different things in it. For me, it was the final uh, part of the film with the faces, because I thought, I, I mean, I've ar I'm arguing, I don't argue in the book because it's a memoir, it's not an essay, but were I to write an essay, I would say, I think that most people that we think, that we call mentally ill are not ill, they're hurt, they're tra suffering trauma. And while there is illness, there is mental illness that's hereditary and that can be helped with drugs. I'm not, I'm not anti-drug, but I think that for people who drugs help, but I think there's too quick to take a medical solution and give somebody a pill and the pill might help them um, put off their symptoms for a while, but it doesn't help them to heal. And, um, and for that, you need some forms of therapy, different forms of therapy. And I think also helping other people helps you to heal. I think that was true for me for sure. Mm -hmm. So I think the image of the faces as I thought, as an image of what it is to be, when I'm talking about be, what it feels like to be a multiple personality, I, I use that term because it, it's, it better describes what I lived through than dissociative identity disorder, which is the correct medical term. Um, what it feels, when I'm talking about what it feels like to be a multiple personality, uh, he has all these beautiful faces on the subway, one after the other, looking at us in this intense way. And it, it kind of lifted me up. I, I'd say it lifted me up. It made me feel, yeah, like I got all this help from my brain, really, is where it came from. I know, I know, I wasn't, I wasn't delusional. I knew it wasn't, I knew it was, it was a voice. It was voices in my head. And they talked when they had permission to talk. That's how my therapist handled it, Rich said, because they're there to protect me. They're, that's their job. So she said to, she would say to them, if you come out in public, you're going to get Judy into trouble. Because they're all children, right? So mm -hmm. she said, you're going to get Judy into trouble. And so they never did come out in public, but they were allowed to come out in front of the people who knew about them, which was very few people. My closest friend, a couple of my closest friends and my brother. And um, yeah, so uh, 
so I could control them in that sense. And I, and I also, yeah. And so by showing them, showing it that way, I don't know, it just made me feel even lighter about it, if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you hope uh, for people who've got similar experiences? Uh, what do you hope for them to get out of seeing uh, your story told in this way? Well, a number of people, you know, have spoken to me who, ha who are themselves diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder or who have some form of, you know, what we would consider severe mental, what I, severe mental injury. And they said that a story of recovery, right, is very rare. Like, because people who recover don't want to talk about, they don't want to identify themselves, someone like me as a public figure, it's very, very rare to identify such a serious mental problem, right? Mm -hmm. Mental disorder. I don't know what to call it. I really don't. Mental problem, you know, um, mental injury. That's what I'll call it. And, um, and, and that it helped them to see, first of all, that someone like me went through this, went through what they're going through. And, um, and it helped, it also helped loved ones like i had a guy come up to me in 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 st john's and he didn't even start to talk to me he was just standing there for so long that i asked him if i could help him you know and he said well my wife went through what you went through and uh and her family doesn't talk to her anymore mm -hmm. and i'm the only support she has and she read your book and it helped her so much but i haven't been able to read it and he started to cry and then he says, but now I can read it because he heard what I had to say. So I think, uh, so I think for people who are going through this kind of hardship, um, maybe helps them think they can get through it and be a healthier person after. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for other people, I hoped for the book that seeing that someone like me who's obviously been quite successful in my life in my own terms, right? And I think, you know, generally I had a TV show, you know, all that stuff um, that, you know, and I have what most people think of as a very serious mental illness because we all, all we know about it is what, you know, three phases of Eve, like the sensationalism from Hollywood, right? Um, and um, yeah, that maybe people will rethink mental illness, just like the, I think the Rendezvous with Madness is trying to do is to say, that any, whatever, it seems to me any mental in, injury, like I like the notion of neurodiversity. We, my brain's different than other people's brain. It is, mm -hmm. it is different. You know, I grew up in a different way. I grew up dissociated, right? So my brain's different, but I have gifts from that too. Like there's gifts that come with it, not just dysfunction. And because of my privilege, I think it's because of my privilege that I survived it. Um, Cause I had like, not only because I'm white and middle class, but that's part of it, but also because I had a lot of support. Um, I was able to get through it. And I think if we had the supports in our societies for everyone who needed it, and not just for people who find themselves, who are in a position, a privileged position, um, things would be very different. And we could have a very different attitude toward people who aren't the same, uh, aren't quote unquote normal, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I hoped I, my book would contribute to that, but I really don't, I'm not sure that it has. Maybe Mike's film more than my book. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, there's a question, uh, and I, I'm just going to do a time check. We don't have too, too much time left, um, but there is a question that's been sent. Um, how uh, have you felt uh, to have had a, a film made about your life? Uh, especially one that was so personal and revealing. And was there anything that you wished had been included or not included? Ah, okay. <laughs> well, um, how did I feel? Well, I, I feel pretty good about it. I feel very happy um, about, you know, how well it's being received. I feel really happy for Mike, you know, who's a good friend of mine. Um, because he's a friend and he did it. it, it it's not like, you know, some Hollywood, you know, director made a film about me. So, um, so I, I don't, I, I don't know, like, a pe but also people are like, the people who are writing about the film are like calling me like names, like, you know, the legendary feminist or the iconic feminist, you know? So like that stuff is affecting me more than that. <laughs> ego, ego stuff. That's, that's, you know, the personal side. Well, you know, I wrote, I was, 
my memoir is very revealing, but I, I think this film is more revealing, mainly because I was talking to a close friend and, mm. you know, I'm not so crazy about certain things that I said, but, you know, it's life, right? <laughs> right. Well, and I, I, I imagine as well, like, to be able to show um, the struggle with mental in injury and the way that you experienced that through art has al is also very important because we, we, of course, have the book, which is... Yeah. It's, it's a form of art, but it's very like detailed and exp explanatory. Linear. It's more linear. It's yeah. very linear, yeah. yeah. Whereas this, we have a, a piece of art that, that tries to show with, with the images you've already explained uh, what it's like or what you, what you experience. Um, and I imagine that that was pretty special for you to see as well. Oh, totally. Like, you know, it also, it helped me to see my life in a little different way, right? Because some, especially someone who knows me well, made this film about me and it's really beautiful and it, it, it makes me see things about my life that I didn't see before. So that's pretty special. Yeah, it's really special. Like I've, I've watched it about five times, right? Mike said, what do you keep watching it for? You know, I can stand to watch it so many times. Perfect. Um, I guess, uh, it, you know, we should probably wrap up, but um, it, we were talking before uh, we went live um, about yeah. the message that you really hope people take from the film. And I think that that would be a really great way for you to sum summarize uh, or to wrap up this discussion. Okay. What do you want people to take away from this film? Well, I, I tell a story in the film that um, Dr. When I was, you know, the, the pro-choice, the pro-choice struggle was very intense and it got violent and I was getting death threats and uh, some people try to get me fired from work and stuff like that. So I asked Henry, who of course got way more threats than I ever got, um, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? And he said, um, you know, when I, when I was in the middle of the fight in Montreal, you know, and he'd been in jail and so on, uh, I, people would say to me on the street, Dr. Ne lâche pas, Dr. Morgenthaler. Ne lâche pas, which means don't give up. And I think that's a really good message for these COVID times, as, as well as to people who are suffering themselves from mental injuries, that um, you can find a way through it and don't, don't give up. Don't give up on yourself, I think is a really important message. Um, my, my announcement that is the last question must have, uh, you know, just pushed someone to ask okay. that last question. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Um, this is a pretty deep question, though, too, so I'm not sure, I mean, you know, up to you to, 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 to answer it if you'd like. Um, so the question is, thank you very much for your vulnerability. Uh, have you forgiven your father? Well, you know, I say, I, I have an answer to this, and my answer is, I'm Jewish. <laughs> don't forgive in the Jewish, in the Jewish tradition. We mm -hmm. hold grudges. Yeah. <laughs> That's my answer. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm getting a note as well that there is another question that I imagine is being um, rapidly typed in for us. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll give that a couple of seconds. Okay. Um, does the experience of multiple personalities influence your perception of self versus others, individual versus collective? And I think that's a very interesting question because we also have Judy, the individual versus capitalism, um, which is a very interesting <laughs> way to frame, uh, <laughs> frame this. Um. Wow, that's a really interesting question. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it does, you know. Um, I think, I certainly think that it helped me navigate um, working in a diverse environment and what that meant and being able to support the anti-racist struggle um, and seeing the importance of it and understanding that, you know, the, I, I was I was an, an anti-racist before I was a feminist. Like I was radicalized during the civil rights movement, right? So I was, in fact, bef before I called myself a feminist, I would have said I was an anti-racist. I knew Black Panthers in New York, you know, all that. But I didn't understand uh, privilege, white privilege. I didn't understand that. I understood racism in a Marxist sense, which is it's a thing, it's an ideology that divides the working class, right? And so I think that my experience of healing and of seeing the, the different perspectives of the different um, alters, my therapist called them, they call them others now, um, of the others, uh, helped me to understand 
racism and the impact of racism better. And the fact that I, when I start to understand privilege, how I would see things different from my social position than other people would see from their social position. Yeah, I think it helped me a lot for that. Right. Great, thank you so much for those wonderful questions. I'm not getting another indication that there are other <laughs> questions. Um, Kelly, is there anything that you want to add? Um, oh my goodness, only that I feel like we could sit here and chat all night. <laughs> How wonderful. I, I know, I, I'm just so very thrilled. Judy, thank you for being so open. And, and for just chatting about everything, you know, in, including, um, you know, these very personal details of your life. I so appreciate it. Nora, thank you so much for bringing your brilliance to this conversation. Um, so if there's no last minute typing happening, I don't think there's any last minute typing happening. So I just want to say thank you to both of you. Is there anything you want to say before I do my official plug for the festival? <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you. So Thanks this, Thanks this for, it was great. It was thank a great conversation. Yeah. Wasn't it though? Thank you so much. Um, and so this is the beginning of the Rendezvous with Madness Festival. This launches us off on 11 days um, filled with films. We have an exhibition that features everything from, you know, installations to dance to theater, you name it. So I do hope that you uh, go to our website and choose some other things. All tickets are pay what you wish, which means they can be zero dollars if you wish. So please do join us. I'm so very happy um, that uh, you were able to join us tonight. And thank you so much again, Judy and Nora, and to our team at ASL Interpretation and Closed Captioning, and to Kat Singer, our active listener tonight. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Are we off air now? Oh, we're still recording. I don't know. Well, they're still recording, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, That's always the, the, the point of the recording, so we can talk. You can like, make it the okay. network offline. Thank awesome. you, thank you. Okay, hey, was that all right? How, does the, how was the <laughs> crowd? Okay? I will change yeah. it now so we can. Yeah. They can hear us. We can hear you. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> Can you stop recording? I just want to talk to Nora a bit. Sure thing. Yep, one second.